What did your research with starving and malnourished children in the Philippines teach you? And did you see similar results with Americans or was that result only consistent with the Philippines children? No, what, what that did, I mean, that was a surprise to me because I was there in the Philippines coordinating this project uh, for feeding malnourished children. And in those days, just us, not just me, but all of us in the nutrition community, uh, there was a, there seemed to be an interest to make sure these kids in these poor countries got enough protein. That meant, that meant high quality animal based protein if possible. And so that's where I came from. I had just happened to have seen almost accidentally that the children look, who seem to be getting more animal protein like we do Westerners do, those children were more at risk of getting liver cancer of all things. Then there was a study that came out from India, usually small animals showing something similar. I was faced with a dilemma at that time. I'm there to increase animal protein consumption or at least protein consumption. But we have this, that's what really generated my research program. Came back home, got some money from NIH to continue for the next 27 years and another grant on top of that to do the China study and a few others. So just to, I, I wanted to find out, I was troubled coming from the farm, teaching and preaching animal protein, the value of that, and then seeing this, I had to know. So that's what really generated my research program. And we did that. We were not interested in whether rats got cancer or not. It had nothing to do with it. But we used to experiment animals only as a means of studying the basic mechanisms of cancer formation, the basic mechanisms for which, let's say, protein affected cancer formation. And I learned so much because when you learn at that level, at the biochemical cellular level, and see how things all work together, it's basically what we see in a cell in a mammal applies generally to all mammals. The outcome may be something different, but it's the basic mechanism is what led to me, uh, the concept of principles, how you work together and how they work together and so forth. What can we do to prevent dementia, Alzheimer's and memory loss? That's a, you know, um, let's say it's a study in you know, it, it's a study, ongoing study, right, uh, ongoing research right now. Uh, I can't say, at least from my perspective, uh, obviously there's others know better about this than, than I do, but it turns out that those kind of uh, problems tend to occur in the more Western types of societies. Consumer is kind of bad, by the way. Uh, we see these sort of correlations. We see some other kinds of evidence to indicate too that these folks are at risk. And now I'm Again, I'm reporting on the work of others, not myself, uh, that, uh, you know, there's some more definitive studies on Alzheimer's, you know, with respect to the kind of diets that are being consumed. And it's kind of fitting this general rubric, this, this same story, consuming high, people say high fat, but I'm going to say, I'm going to say uh, basically high animal foods diet. They're at more, greater risk. I think it's a safe statement really to make at greater risk for those kinds of diseases. How do we bridge the gap between what we tend to know in science and what we convey through policy-making decisions? Why is the science of nutrition ignored in medicine? Well, I spent about uh, 20 active, very active years in policy development uh, on developing national and even international food and health policy especially focused on, uh, on nutrition. So I've had a firsthand experience working with that question. Uh, what can we do, essentially? Uh, and I, I'm at times I get quite discouraged uh, because uh, if we look at the kind of advice, let's say that the government formulates for the public at large, um, dietary guidelines, for example, or let's say the amount of nutrients we should be consuming, uh, those kind of directives, those kind, that kind of, uh, those kind of reports that tend to be updated every five years or so, uh, they're very strongly uh, influenced by the Western diet. In turn, strongly influenced by the industries behind it. I mean, the livestock industry, of which I was a part, <laughs> the livestock industry is, is very powerful. We know that. Uh, they want to keep their business. Uh, so in a sense, 
unfortunately, as we're using that kind of food, we're creating more sick people who serve then as uh, subjects, as patients for medication. So now we bring into the pharmaceutical company. The, the livestock industry helps to create disease, oftentimes with subsidies of our tax dollars, taxpayer dollars. They, they, in a sense, are sort of creating the disease and the numbers of victims or patients to serve as customers for the use of drugs. And so in that equation, on both ends of the, both of those uh, pillar points, if you will, we're pushing animal food diet first it being because it's being produced by the one industry. In the second case, it doesn't hurt to have some other business and, and solving problems. So here's the, here's the point that goes to your question, I think. That is that uh, we have to find ways to educate the public on this very powerful effect of nutrition. On that point, and I, I define nutrition as the biological expression of food. I don't mix it up with the word diet, food, and nutrition. They're not, they're not synonymous, really. I, I'd like to look at it from the nutritional perspective. Nutrition is not taught in medical schools. Not one medical school in the country. So doctors aren't trained in this area. In their big research agencies, which funded most of my research, like NIH, for example, there, there is in the neighborhood of like 27 separate institutes, one for cancer, heart disease, and so forth and so on. There's not one for nutrition. So we're not, we're not focused on the research of nutrition. We're not training our doctors. And thirdly, the, the mechanism for, their, for doctors to be compensated, to reimburse for their services, you know, from insurance companies or Medicare, whatever the case may be, there's not a, a easy, it's not easy for them to actually collect reimbursement by, by giving nutritional advice. So we have a big, big critical problem, I would argue. And uh, so we have to address that question, really understand what's going on at that level. And I say that those agencies and the government that come out every year tend to, it's almost like it, 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 the fallback position is just, just push more of the same. Uh, those, those are very political decisions run by departments uh, that are political appointees, the Secretary of Agriculture, the Secretary of this and that, they're all political. And so uh, it, it's really subject to the political will of the day, which tends to be, you know, don't, don't stir the pot too much, let's keep on doing what we're doing. You know, try to do a little of this, a little of that someplace. We need to have major overhaul. And the way we can get major overhaul, in my view, these kind of conferences, for one thing, I hope. Uh, the other is uh, basically the government should be playing a little more active role in getting medical schools to offer nutrition in order for them to receive any, uh, any funding that they may get from the federal, from the federal sources. So that's one thing. And then just bring it to the attention of the public where we're not delivering this kind of information to the public for obvious reasons. Because the corporate sector, two major segments of the corporate sector are basically controlling the conversation. And buying politicians, by the way. Yeah, what, what, uh, what advice do we get from disease groups and what is a disease group? Well, I'm not sure what, what exactly who, who would post that question, but the disease group, uh, I see it as uh, degenerative diseases. I, I give some group that I'm familiar with. Degenerative diseases are those kinds that tend to occur with age. You know, the, the higher and higher risk as we get older. Uh, heart disease, various kinds of cardiovascular diseases, stroke and, and so forth. Uh, cancers, diabetes, some autoimmune diseases as well, uh, metabolic disorders. Uh, those are the degenerative diseases, that's a group. Uh, a second group we might say are the infectious diseases, communicable diseases, usually initiated diseases initiated by foreign organisms, pathogens, bacteria, now uh, uh, viruses. Now, I mean, we're becoming aware of viruses. We've had them all throughout our entire human history. But in any case, 
viruses, bacteria, some fungi, you know, these little beasties that, that we're surrounded with. Those are the infectious communicable diseases. We can transmit our disease to someone else. We can't transmit communicable, I mean, we can't transmit degenerative diseases to another group. We don't transmit heart disease. We don't transmit diabetes. Those are functions of what we do with ourselves. So there's a couple of groups, communicable diseases, run by, initiated by pathogens, little microorganisms, if you will, on the one hand, degenerative diseases is another one. And then there's others, there's neurological behavioral issues too that don't quite fit that category, uh, which have more to do with psychological, social, I mean, it's the whole gamut, I would suggest, of anything that tends to affect our behavior and what we think of ourselves and that kind of thing. You know, difficulties we may have uh, mentally at times. That's kind of another category. Uh, that's about, that's my grouping. I don't know what, what it might mean for someone else. But.